you, Becky, for not just what you've just said. I've been earwigging by the door there to hear you. But the great work you do as MP for Salford, but also the great work you do around the Shadow Cabinet table. You're absolutely brilliant the way you've got across a very complicated brief and are putting forward those strong arguments for a decent economic future for all of us. Becky, thank you so much. And to Andrew Gwynn, who did such incredible work with Ian Lavery in masterminding our election campaign and his great work in local government. Thank you, Andrew, for all that you do. And the North West is very well represented around the Shadow Cabinet table. I want to thank all of our North West MPs who are part of the team. Those around the Shadow Cabinet, Angela Rayner, Shadow Education Secretary, fantastic work she does. That spirit of education for all, whatever your station in life. Thank you, Angela, for the wonderful <laughs> Debbie for the work she does in holding the government to account, chasing them down on the injustice of universal credit. Debbie, thanks for what you do. <laughs> Up for mental health, speaking up for social care, speaking up particularly for the needs of older people in our society. You bring such passion and strength to the table, as does our young person's representative, Minister, Shadow Minister for Youth Engagement, MP for Lancaster and Fleetwood. You get, I think it's the 41 bus straight over to Lancaster. We need to go there. Cat Smith, thank you for all this. Shadow Economic Secretary Peter Dow and the work he does with John McDonnell in putting forward a strong and transformational agenda. And so that is a great team, and there are many others all across the North West who are in the other positions in our shadow teams. We're in Blackpool today. I wish there were two MPs in Blackpool. As far as I'm concerned, there's really only one. Gordon Marsden, thank you for all the determined to deliver our agenda of the opportunities of university, college, higher and adult education for all throughout their lives. That is the Labour way. Gordon, thank you. And our MEPs for the region, Julie Ward, Theresa Griffin and Wajid Khan, thank you so much for everything you do as uh, MEPs for our region. Because we need This has been a difficult year in the North West as everywhere else. We've been through some testing times. The terrorist attack at the Manchester Arena, which preceded other attacks in London, was one of the most awful atrocities in this country for many years. Taking the lives of innocent adults and children without discrimination, it was a brutal attempt to divide communities and set us against each other. And yet, when I attended the vigil in Albert Square straight after the attack, I was inspired by the mood of love, community and solidarity that had so obviously prevailed throughout the city. I was moved by the words of the poet Peter Walsh and what he wrote after the attack and read out to an utterly silent Albert Square that day. We keep fighting back with greater Manchester spirit. Northern grit, northern wit, and greater Manchester's lyrics. And these hard times again, in these streets of our city. But we won't take defeat, and we don't want your pity. Because this is a place where we stand strong together, with a smile on our face. Greater Manchester, forever. That's what we writing that, and thank you to all those that came to Albert Square that day. There were many actions of heroism and bravery that night, most notably the emergency service personnel who attended the scene to save lives in response to the situation in the most difficult and harrowing circumstances imaginable. The stories we heard from that evening and the scenes we saw on television, or even in real life, 
brought home the vital importance of our emergency services to show more than ever that we must value them with deeds as well as words. Praising the emergency services with words is easy. But ensuring that they're properly paid, given the resources they need to do their job and keep people safe, must be and will be a priority for the next Labour government. the Mayor of Greater Manchester, for his response to the attack and his standing up and helping to bring together the city to which he'd only just been elected to represent. He's already shown what a brilliant job he will be, what a brilliant Mayor he will be for Greater Manchester and why the people of that city made the right choice in electing him so convincingly. What an amazing result. Well done, Andy. We miss you in the shadow cover, but Manchester, our loss is Manchester's gain. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> I also want to congratulate my great friend, Steve Rotherham. Steve, who was elected the first mayor of Liverpool City Region. Steve was my parliamentary private secretary until he became the mayor of Liverpool. And since he's gone, we've missed his wit, we've missed his humour, and we don't have as many Liverpool scarves around here. <laughs> <laughs> and we, we certainly miss Steve's brilliant advice that he helped and gave me. But he is doing a fantastic job, and we're speaking later on for Liverpool City Region. Never was a, a more appropriate and better voice for Merseyside than Steve Rotherham. Steve, we miss you, we thank you, and we know what great achievements you're going to make as Mayor of Liverpool City Region. Steve Rotherham. is uh, I'm sure the easiest job in the world in advising me and telling me to get somewhere where I'm supposed to be and where I have not yet arrived. Um, it's now being done by Kate Holland, wonderful Kate Holland, MP for Blackburn, who does a fantastic job and is an enormous help to our team and our effectiveness in challenging this government in Parliament. Thank you, Kate, for all of you. Andy's elections in May were brilliant results for Liverpool and Greater Manchester, but also great results for our party. They were a fantastic precursor of the gains we made here in the North West in the general election. Indeed, the North West now has the enviable accolade of being the region with the highest Labour vote in the country. Thank you. Very North, Crew in Nantwich, Weaver Vale, and Warrington South. Hey. And Warrington South was the first campaign stop I made on the road in the general election campaign. Yes. As we were heading towards Warrington, I said to the people who were driving, I said, What's going to happen now? I said, Oh, there'll be a few people there to go out canvassing. <laughs> <laughs> so we're driving down the road and we're looking for the house where we were supposed to be canvassing from, and I said, a lot of people outside that house into a wedding on <laughs> I didn't know you could get 200 people in the front garden <laughs> <laughs> a semi-detached house in one row. What an incredible start. And that was before even a campaign had been selected. And down the road in Crew and Language, there were even more people. That was the spirit that gained us 3 million votes in the general election. And that was the spirit that gave us this incredible, but sadly not quite good enough result in the general election. Thank you to all of you. <laughs> of those constituencies we gained, the media pundits had predicted we couldn't win any of them. But, with our commitment, our huge new membership, and our manifesto for the many, not the few, and the policy platform that spoke to people's needs, we proved all those self-appointed experts so wrong. The people of this country do want change, and with Labour, they will get that change.
taste of things to come. We already know that in the days after the election, this government, this Tory government, ditched key policies because Labour had won the argument in the election campaign. Your campaign in the election stopped the attacks on social care, the so-called dementia tax. It stopped ushering in a whole new generation of grammar schools and get more education segregation. It protected winter fuel payments and the triple lock for pensioners. And in recent weeks, we forced them to make the universal credit helpline free. And they lost the vote. And they lost the vote calling for a pause in the whole scheme, the whole scheme of universal credit that's causing such poverty, debt, and homelessness. In vote after vote in Parliament, they've been defeated. Public sector pay, forcing them into a U-turn on protecting people living in supported housing. And just this week, in a binding vote to release their secret assessments of the impact of Brexit. These are Labour victories in Parliament from a minority position because we've won the arguments and we have public support for all of those policies that we've just gained victories on in Parliament. Wouldn't it be good if it was a Labour government in the majority delivering those divided government, losing support, losing votes in Parliament, and losing the argument. It's Labour that has the ideas, the capability to govern in everybody's interests, while the Conservatives have descended into infighting across the Cabinet table amidst their failing Brexit negotiations. After the election, it was apparent that the Prime Minister would have to get by with very little support in Parliament. But we didn't know just how little support she would have in her own party as well. The Labour Party, on the other hand, is advancing. Indeed, our ideas are beginning to proliferate through the country. So much that some are beginning to reach the cabinet table itself. <laughs> Many of you will have seen Simon Javid, the Communities and Local Government Secretary on the Andrew Marr Show two weeks ago. He admitted that he was pressurising poor old Philip Hammond in the Treasury to borrow £50 billion to spend on building houses. That's after seven years of denying people adequate housing, as well as decent wages, a functioning NHS, or an acceptable education system, because of the government's political choice to impose austerity. We now have senior cabinet ministers realising their plummeting popularity, completely changing their mind, and admitting the pain and misery they put the country through has been for nothing. Of course, I do welcome ministers finally recognising that, just like if you're running a business, it makes sense to borrow to invest, because it will produce a return in the future. Indeed, ministers saying this proves that Labour are winning the important economic arguments. But it highlights the disarray the Tories are in. Whether Sajid Javid's desired borrowing ever actually occurs or not is another question. And it certainly won't be enough to get us out of the Tory housing crisis. But based on the Tories' record over the last seven years, we can be certain that if there is any extra investment in the autumn budget, very little will come to areas such as the North West. One of the many flaws of British capitalism is not only it's causing money to flow from working people into the hands of the rich, and the rich poor divide is getting wider and wider, but it's also causing capital flow from the north to the, of the country to London and the South East. This is why a future Labour government will be committed to implementing a genuine industrial strategy, as Becky has been outlined so that every nation and region of Britain can share in the country's growth and prosperity. <clears throat> Part of this industrial strategy will be ensuring that we're investing in people's skills. 
creating a national education service, which Angela is doing, so that everybody has a chance to acquire technical or academic qualifications, free at the point of use, including university courses at degree level. This Nobody is held back by prohibitive student debts as at present, but also that the British population has the skills necessary and the opportunities to retrain and upskill for a high-tech modern economy. Another part of such an industrial strategy will be capital investment, putting money into the economy to boost growth and improve the infrastructure that businesses and individuals rely on. That's why we are so committed to developing a new network of regional development banks so that we can ensure that areas such as the Northwest will always be included in a genuine national strategy of investment. Everybody's fed up with the government's condescending talk of the Northern Powerhouse, which means little more than piecemeal pet projects for government ministers, most of which end up being delayed or abandoned, as in the case of the downgrading of the Manchester to Leeds railway line or the Midland Main Line and so many others. According to the IPPR, Institute of Public Policy Research, while London is in receipt of almost £2,000 per head in transport spending, the North receives approximately £400. Not only does this huge disparity of investment damage the North, but the imbalance in the economy changes the country as a whole. I say that as somebody who represents a London area. I fully understand. We cannot go on with this growing and appalling regional disparity in the way government money is handed out. A Labour government will change that. governments are unable to bias their investment plan so heavily against the majority of the country. We're absolutely committed to a new crossrail for the North, at least 10 billion worth of funding focused on linking the great northern cities. This will be part of a nationally integrated, sustainable transport system which is both affordable and accessible. And our Shadow Transport Secretary, Andy McDonald, representing Middlesbrough, fully understands that and is working flat out to achieve that. It will not only include a publicly owned railway system, yes. run for people and not for profit, but also... <laughs> but also upgraded cycling infrastructure as well as encouraging locally owned and accountable bus services. Here in Blackpool, here in Blackpool, the municipally owned Blackpool Transport outperforms private operators because it aims to deliver a good service to passengers and not just a fat return for shareholders. Catsmith is working with Andy on developing our strategy for buses all across the country. There are about one and a half billion rail journeys made per year. There are more than three times that number of bus journeys made per year. Come the general election, we'll have a very clear strategy of improving bus services over the whole country and ensuring a real reach to every community, including rural communities, of a publicly owned bus service. suffered relative isolation along Britain's coast, but in, an improved transport is vital for such towns if they to rely on tourism and visitors from elsewhere. It's only by investing in this transport infrastructure that we can encourage people out of their cars and into a national public transport system that must serve 
as I've laid out, both urban and rural areas. Indeed, it's often the rural infrastructure that is in most need of investment. That's why we're also committed to universal, super-fast broadband availability by 2022. And we'll look at how to roll the, the ultra-fast broadband within the next decade. This is needed to protect the rural economy that so many parts of the country rely on. We know that um, Liam Fox and the Conservatives are intent on running down local agriculture and fishing so that we can get knockoff imports from the US and Brazil. Even if this threatens farmers losing their payments as they are priced out of a dysfunctional global food market. If we do not defend our farming standards and take bold steps to protect our environment, then our whole rural way of life will be under threat. This is why Labour is committed to maximising our use of renewable energy through <coughs> publicly owned energy companies, and it's why the next Labour government will ban fracking without... <laughs> Environmental and rural economic protection is yet another reason why we have to be serious about getting the Brexit deal with Brussels that benefits every part of the UK. The determination of Tory leaders to turn Britain into an offshore tax haven off the coast of Europe would, no doubt, benefit some of their friends, the very fat, and they are very fat, fat cats in the city of London. But, it will hugely damage the rights and living standards of everybody else in the country. Labour's position on Brexit has always been clear. We accept the result of the referendum and are therefore pushing for a jobs first Brexit deal that puts people and not big business at its core. jobs and living standards, and environmental protection and workers' rights. We have to have a deal that allows for every region and nation in the UK to prosper as we build a genuinely close and cooperative relationship with our fellow Europeans, as I've been doing ever since I became leader of this party. <coughs> Labour has always been, and as far as I'm concerned, always will be, a party of international solidarity. Which is why, if we were in government, we would immediately give EU nationals, European Union nationals, living and working in our communities in Britain, and helping us in so many ways, the knowledge and the certainty they're welcome here and can continue to call Britain their home. They are part of our community. We should recognise this and recognise the fantastic contribution they make to our society. In contrast, the Tories' policy of using European Union nationals living in Britain as a Brexit bargaining chip is completely inhumane. But in the light of the last seven years of government, no surprise whatsoever. Just look at another aspect this government's treatment of refugees. It is shameful that the UK has neither met its legal or its moral duty to take in sufficient international refugees. Whether they be adults or children who are fleeing disease, famine or war. These are people, human beings like all of us, who deserve our help and our humanity. Something the Tory government has <coughs> Support refugees. <laughs> 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 people on so 
Social Security since 2010. The government's rollout of universal credit punishes, pun, pun, punishes people for no other reason than being poor and forces them into further poverty, further debt, and further instability. There is no doubt that Labour is beginning to win the war of words when it comes to Tories DWP regime. Our strong opposition forced the government, scrapped the 55p a minute maximum charge on the universal credit helpline that many claimants had to ring to get the support they were simply entitled to. But we're now calling on the government to pause the rollout of universal credit in its entirety whilst its multiple failures are examined and hopefully repaired. It's shocking, <coughs> absolutely shocking, that the government is willing to accept a situation where one in four new claimants are not receiving their first universal credit payment within the defined six week period, which itself is far too long. It not only displays incompetence on the government's part, but it's grossly unfair to those waiting so long for the payments, what's in need to heat their homes, buy their food, or pay their rent. That's why Andy Burnham was completely right to call on the government to halt the universal credit rollout due to the huge effect it will have on the number of rough sleepers in Greater Manchester, but also across the whole country. The fact that universal credit is putting so many families into debt and making so many homeless shows how it's not just damaging individual people's lives, but affects entire communities. We mustn't forget that so far, universal credit has only been rolled out to a minority of recipients. Its punishing effects are only due to become more <coughs> widespread and more prevalent. That's why we need a Labour government to not just end the six-week delay in payment of universal credit, but to fully reform the whole benefit system. welfare state have that a welfare state genuinely doesn't leave anybody behind. It gives everybody dignity and the opportunities they deserve to make the best of their lives. And of course, people must have dignity when they're in work also, as well as when they're not. At present, 55% of people in poverty live in a household where somebody is in work. We have NHS nurses being forced to visit food banks as they can't make ends meet. Just think about that. NHS nurses going to food banks because they can't afford to make ends meet. So improving people's settlement of work must involve increasing pay, which is why Labour is committed to a real living wage of at least £10 an hour by 2020. genuinely listened to. Everybody must be genuinely listened to because abuse of power often hides in plain sight. We know it's there, especially those who experience it every day. But as a society, too often we don't challenge it. Change happens when, led by those who suffer from abuse of power, we collectively stand up and say, no more. So, Faced with ongoing revelations about sexual harassment, we must make this a turning point and a moment of real change. We must say no more. We must no longer allow women, or anyone else for that matter, to be abused in the workplace or anywhere else. This is not about peering into some dark recesses. This kind of abuse, sexism and misogyny, has been hiding in plain sight. It's all around us. It is sadly in our schools and universities, it is in our businesses and our workplaces, newspapers and on our TV screens. And yes, it's not enough to say this is wrong, then only tinker with procedures. How we respond to this moment will shape the way we live our lives. 
we need to make a fundamental shift in the balance of power and transform the way our society works. Labour is committed not just to challenging a warped and degrading culture in Westminster and across society, but to overturning it. This week, we appointed a leading barrister to investigate if and how the party got it so painfully wrong in the case of Lex Bailey. We are not afraid to turn the spotlight on ourselves. And we are now appointing an independent organisation to offer confidential advice and support to anyone affected by sexual harassment in our party. An additional first step for reporting complaints to guide and support complainants through our procedures. But this change <clears throat> must be broader and deeper than just in political parties or in one workplace, the House of Parliament. Our movement, the Labour movement, founded in the workplace, standing up to abuses and imbalances of power. Trade unions, the representatives of people at work, are crucial to taking on and rooting out sexual harassment and discrimination in the workplace. That is why those who seek to weaken trade unions are undermining action to deal with sexual harassment and sexism at work. Trade unions must be at the forefront of this change. Conference. As socialists, it's our job to ensure that working people's voices are heard at every level of society. As technology continues to develop, we will have unprecedented opportunities to build a whole new economy and whole new models of work or conducting business that are both more democratic and more inclusive than anything that currently exists. That's why Labour has commissioned our report on alternative models of ownership to examine how our economy could be designed to benefit everybody in the digital age. The report suggests we should support cooperatives, higher wages for workers, shorter working week and profit sharing schemes and give control of the digital economy to those who actually work in it. This is all part of building a new economy worthy of the 21st century that our industrial strategy will drive forward. It must be high wage, high tech, and it must be green and sustainable. Conference, this is the bold vision which Labour has for the type of society we want. A society that includes every single person that lives here, a society that works for every part of the country, a society that doesn't discriminate on class, gender, sexuality or race. A society where everybody, everybody has the opportunity to improve their lives. A society where everybody is listened to. That is the social society we are aspiring to. That is our vision as a party and a movement, together, united. <coughs> We've never been more ready to form a government and make that vision a reality. Conference, we have great struggles ahead of us. We have people to bring on board. We have causes to fight. That's why the Labour movement was founded. That's what's made us so strong. That's what inspired us through the general election campaign. That's what inspired us now in taking the fight to the Tories. And that is what is going to defeat them and deliver a government that really does work for the many. Not the